Well, good morning, everyone. You know, when Alice and Ethan and I and others are thinking about the planning of such an event, it dawned on me, I thought, there is no way we're going to have weather like this this morning. And yet, here we are. We're not sweltering like so many of us do on July 4th mornings for years past, present, and future. So God has blessed us with a most glorious day. I think William Samuel Johnson is quite happy that we're doing this for him and his compatriots. Amen. You know, it's interesting, of course, as a professional historian, what is the background reading that I do on Samuel Johnson? So you can come up to me afterwards if you want my card or you want to know about more further reading. But the first place I went to was a friend of mine wrote a book called Connecticut Families in the Revolution by my friend Mark Allen Baker. I looked up William Samuel Johnson. He wasn't in there. I thought, uh-oh, we're not off to a good start here. So, of course, that's what we historians do. We dig and we dig and we find fun information. I thought the most fun was when I found some, some fun quotes that I'll share with you at the end. So without further ado, here we go. So don't worry, compatriots and friends, it wasn't until two years ago that I had not heard of William Samuel Johnson. The first thought was, who's that? William Samuel Johnson is not to be confused with the famous British writer Samuel Johnson. And William was born right here in Stratford, Connecticut on the 7th of October in 1727 and died on the 14th of November in 1819 at the age of 92. While it would have been more comfortable to be standing at this, his place of burial, on the 7th of October in hopes of nicer weather, we have it, fortunately. Uh, however, I also know that numerous volunteers from both DAR and SAR would assert that they sweated for days, no weeks, and many of them as they toiled away on restoring this cemetery all summer long. And for those heroic efforts, they deserve our utmost hearty, enthusiastic gratitude. The good news is that no one had to sweat out over the uh, Constitution ratified, like William Samuel Johnson and others did. And imagine not having air conditioning or even an electric fan all summer long if they did so. William was born to Samuel Johnson, a well-known Anglican clergyman, and later president of King's, later known as Columbia College and Johnson's first wife, Charity Floyd Nickel. I don't know if there's any relation, and I couldn't determine it, but DAR ladies may be intrigued to know that she, as a Floyd, could be a relative of Mary Floyd Talmadge, the namesake of Mary Floyd Talmadge chapter of the Connecticut DAR, and also daughter of New York signer of the Declaration of Independence, William Floyd, who is the only signer to have not one, but two houses still standing one is in the National Park on Long Island, and the other is where he died in upstate New York. And of course, yes, I have been to those locations. Furthermore, Mary Floyd married Major Benjamin Talmadge, a graduate of Yale, classmate and friend of Nathan Hale, and who just completed his work as serving as both cavalry officer and case officer for the now famous Culper spy ring. I say Senator Johnson because this locally prominent and then famous but until 2014, largely forgotten founding father of Connecticut's colony and then state, was eventually a U.S. Senator. But wait, I should mention in passing that I must admit I'd never heard of William Samuel Johnson until I did some research as a historian on the various signers of the various founding documents that were instrumental in creating our represent representational republic of the United States, culminating in the U.S. Constitution created in 1787, and of course, not yet ratified until 1788. Anyway, I had never heard of Johnson, and when I discovered that he was not only from Stratford, but also buried in a well-marked grave here in Stratford, I immediately alerted my two Stratford compatriot friends, Rich Kendall and Ethan Stewart. <laughs> Johnson graduated from Yale in 1744, going on to receive a master's degree from his alma mater in 1747. Do the math and you may be startled to know he was only 20 when he earned his master's. The same year he received an honorary degree from Harvard. Nowadays you'll probably agree with me that as a former prep school teacher and dorm head we're lucky if we can get a 20 year old to finish his year of college learning more than grievance studies and now not to study the likes of local heroes like William Samuel Johnson, Roger Sherman, Oliver Wolcott, Samuel Huntington, or Oliver Ellsworth. Parents, you'll understand when I say you're apt 
project, you have your project project your own values on your children's generation and hope they will follow in your own footsteps. This might explain why Johnson did not heed his father's urging to become a minister, but instead pursued a legal career. What we all appreciate learning about Johnson is that he was a well-respected legal authority, and for that reason he was consulted by many of Connecticut's founding fathers as they made their trips to Philadelphia to represent Connecticut in various editions of the Continental and then U.S. Congress. This list includes the aforementioned governors and Declaration of Independence signers, Oliver Wolcott and Samuel Huntington, but also Roger Sherman, as well as Oliver Ellsworth, William Williams, Governor Jonathan Trumbull, and Silas Dean, diplomat to France who hailed from Wethersfield. Before the American Revolution broke out in 1775, Johnson was sent to London, England to serve as a representative of the colony of Connecticut. Imagine this long forgotten chapter in Connecticut's history. He appeared before British Parliament to su advocate successfully for Connecticut's rights to Native American territory, territory in what was then called Wyoming Territory. And no, I'm not referring to what is now Wyoming, but instead to the western part of the modern state of Pennsylvania. Johnson, much to my own surprise, also served as colonel in the Connecticut militia during the American Revolution. It was, however, after the war that he gained his notoriety as both a U.S. Senator and signer of the U.S. Constitution. Speaking of the Constitution, we in Connecticut are likely aware that our DMV license plates say the Constitution State on them, but that's not because of the famous 1787 Constitution. Rather, it pays homage to the 1639 document known as the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It was Roger Sherman, William Johnson, and Oliver Ellsworth who were the three representatives from Connecticut to head back down to venerable Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. Lest any of you think that Congress moves like molasses nowadays, I like to remind contemporaries like yourselves that Congress moved even slower in those days, and it wasn't just because they were in horse and buggy. For example, it took over a year to ratify our famous Constitution. Why? Because much like nowadays, no one could ever possibly agree on even fundamental issues. So we had, or might say were cursed with, two unofficial political parties, then known as anti-federalists in confrontation with the Federalists. Unlike today's triumphant tweets and titanic disasters of press conferences, back then the difference between of a political opinion could lead one congressman to cane another. On the floor of Congress, or worse yet, as I'm sure you're well aware, come to blows with another weapon, the dueling pistol. Yikes. Imagine nowadays if Clinton and Trump were to meet in Weehawk and to settle their differences on a dueling ground overlooking New York City on the Hudson River. Oh, well, not only did Hamilton die now famously in 1804 at the hands of Vice President, he was the sitting Vice President at the time, Aaron Burr, but Hamilton also nearly came to duel with future President James Monroe. Thankfully, I am not aware of any evidence of William ever engaging in a duel to settle differences or slights to his reputation, or harming another's for that matter. Yet it was Alexander Hamilton who, in agreement with Mr. Johnson, wanted 13 states to come to a reasonable consensus that the U.S. Constitution would once and for all put to rest the risk of anarchy embodied in such civil uprisings as Captain Daniel Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts in 1786, as well as the Risky Rebellion and other contemporary challenges. Hamilton argued that the U.S. federal government needed the power to tax in order to collect revenue. So in conclusion, I wish to offer several thought-provoking quotes from Mr. Johnson. And I quote, He knows not his own strength, who hath not met adversity. A second quote, To keep your secret is wisdom, to expect others to keep it is folly. <laughs> and finally, whatever you have, spend less. <laughs> These fine words come from Stratford's founding father, who will no longer be forgotten, a founding father, thanks to the incredible efforts of volunteers such as Ethan and Barbara Stewart. Thank you, sir. <laughs>